Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Tom Sharp, the Associate Director of Programs with the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy, and I'd like to welcome you to this morning's press briefing about the case of Pleasant Grove City, Utah versus Summum which will be argued before the United States Supreme Court next Wednesday, November 12th. For those of you who uh, aren't familiar with ACS, it's a national organization of lawyers, uh, legal scholars, law students, policymakers, and others who are devoted to um, promoting a progressive view of the Constitution, law, and policy. And um, our, our mission is to ensure that fundamental principles of <clears throat> human dignity, individual rights and liberties, genuine equality, and access to justice may, uh, have their rightful central place in American law. One of the ways we carry out our, our mission is to hold briefings like today's, where we um, highlight and provide information about key cases before the Supreme Court and tap, the, uh, tap a panel of experts like the distinguished group we've assembled for today um, who will discuss the case and its implications for the law. And so we're very pleased and thank all of the experts for joining us today. The, um, before we get started, I just want to mention today's panel is being recorded, so just ask folks if you, if you haven't already to take a moment to silence any cell phones and devices and so we don't have any noise during the presentation. And I want to let you know that we are, we'll, our panel has set aside time at the end to answer your questions. So if you would, please hold, hold your questions until then, and we'll have a microphone which we'll bring around to you. And if you would, state your name and any organizational affiliation before you ask your question. So now, on to the panel. Uh, today's panel is uh, going to be moderated by Professor Chip Lupu, who is the F. L. Wood and Eleanor Davis Professor of Law at George Washington University. Professor Lupu teaches in the area of constitutional law and over the past 20 years has written extensively about the uh, variety of issues related to religion and the Constitution. So we're very pleased to have him with us today, and I turn it over to Professor Lupu. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks to the ACS for the invitation and for holding the program. Uh, my, my task today as the moderator is to, for, is to lay out very briefly the facts and the legal background of the case, and then introduce the four speakers and uh, let them, let them address the issues. <clears throat> each of them will have about 10 minutes, and then we can have them talk to each other some, and as well as turn, uh, turn the, the matter over for questions. The case it presents a very engaging story. Pleasant Grove City is a primarily residential community, population just under 30,000, 35 miles south of Salt Lake City, about 10 or 12 miles north of Provo, Utah. A majority in the community of Pleasant Grove are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, more commonly known as Mormons. Pleasant Grove contains a public space known as Pioneer Park, <coughs> excuse me, where one will find, we're told in the briefs, 15 permanent displays, displays standing in the park, of which at least 11 were donated to the city by private parties. These include a millstone from the city's first flour mill, a 9-11 monument donated by a local Eagle Scout troop, and a Ten Commandments monument donated by the Fraternal Order of the Eagles, Eagles everywhere in Pleasant Grove. Yes, you get that. In 1971, around the United States, you may know this, the Fraternal Order of Eagles have contributed many such monuments, that is Ten Commandments monuments, including one on the Texas State House grounds that was the subject of the Supreme Court's decision in Van Orden versus Perry in 2005. In 2003, that is two years before the Supreme Court decided those Ten Commandments cases, a small religious group known as Summum, headquartered in Salt Lake City, asked Pleasant Grove City, as well as a few other small Utah cities, to accept and display a monument which contained the seven aphorisms of Summum. The aphorisms are brief statements of the seven principles of summum. And if you look on the summum website, and if you find those principles, you'll see they're actually uh, rather long and elaborate paragraphs to explain each one. But each principle has, I won't try to explain them, but each principle has a name. And so let me just name the principles for you. Respectively, psychokinesis, correspondence, vibration, opposition, 
rhythm, cause and effect, and gender. It's not clear whether the proposed Summa Monument would include only those words, the principle of gender, the principle of opposition, or whether it might have included some slightly more elaborate explanation. Pleasant Grove City refused to accept and display the monument. The city officials responded to Summum that all displays in the park either had to be offered by local residents or relate to the history of the city, and that the proposed Summum display met neither criterion. Summum then brought suit against Pleasant Grove City. And Summum argued that Pioneer Park was a traditional public forum and that someone was therefore entitled to the same access for permanent displays as the Fraternal Order of Eagles and other groups, and that Pleasant Grove was unconstitutionally favoring traditional Judeo-Christian precepts, such as those reflected in the Ten Commandments. The Federal District Court ruled in favor of the city and refused to order dis display of the monument. Summum then appealed to the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, which reversed the district court and ruled that because the park is a traditional public forum for speech, the city could not discriminate against private speakers, even those seeking to place permanent displays in the park without a very good reason, which the city lacked. The appeals court then ordered the city to display the Summa Monument pending further proceedings in the case. The city then asked the Tenth Circuit to rehear the case on Bonk. No, excuse me, I, I'm sorry. That <coughs> the Summum that appealed to the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, which reversed the district court and ruled that because the park is a traditional public forum, the city could not discriminate against private speakers. All right, the city then asked the Tenth Circuit to rehear the case on Bonk. And by a six to six vote, the Tenth Circuit denied the request. Two judges wrote dissents from the denial of rehearing. One of the dissenters was Michael McConnell, a very prominent judge who argued that unlike temporary forms of expression like handbills, flyers, or the spoken word, any permanent display in a city park should be viewed as the government's own speech. Thus, according to Judge McConnell, the displays did not create a forum for monuments, but the displays did have to comply with Establishment Clause limits because the government was responsible for the content of such displays. Of course, by this time, it was after 2005, the Supreme Court had ruled on the Ten Commandments cases, and there was some reason to think that the Ten Commandments monument in Pioneer Park would be constitutionally acceptable. Pleasant Grove City having failed to get a rehearing in the Tenth Circuit on Bank, successfully petitioned the Supreme Court to review the case. <clears throat> the city's argument is that privately donated monuments are not themselves government speech, but the collection of monuments is a kind of government speech. And the city analogizes the collection to a city-owned library or museum where the city has very broad discretion about what to include or exclude. Summum continues to argue that Pioneer Park is a forum for privately donated monuments and other kinds of speech, and that its monuments deserve equal access to that forum. The case has attracted a wide variety of amicus briefs, including one from the United States Solicitor General, many civil liberties groups, and representatives of many cities and states. And the case is thick with intriguing angles. And here to play them out, we have four very distinguished constitutional lawyers. I will introduce them all at once in the order in which they'll speak, and then I'll turn the program over to the four of them. First, and this is from my right, on my right, <coughs> on my immediate right, and then going to the right. <coughs> this first speaker will be Aisha Khan, who is the legal director of Americans United for Separation of Church and State, where she oversees the organization's litigation designed to advance and maintain the constitutionally required wall between government and religion. Before joining Americans United, Ms. Khan was staff counsel for the ACLU's National Prison Project, where she conducted complex litigation regarding prison and jail conditions. Her organization has filed an amicus brief in the case on the side of neither party. Next, we're going to have James Bopp, who is the general counsel for the James Madison Center for Free Speech and an attorney with the law firm of Bopp, Colson, and Bostrom in Terre Haute, Indiana. 
He is an expert in campaign finance and election law, and he has litigated numerous high-profile cases regarding the intersection of election issues and free speech. He's also testified and written regularly on these issues. <coughs> and his organization, the James <coughs> Madison Center, has filed an amicus brief in this case on the side of Pleasant Grove City. Third, we're going to hear from Robert Ritter, who is the legal coordinator of the Apignani, I hope I'm saying that correctly, Very humanist, good. Very good. <laughs> humanist Legal Center of the American Humanist Association, where he directs the Legal Center's activity and represents the Humanist Association in its advocacy and coalition efforts aimed at ensuring that the humanists and all other persons are treated fairly by our legal system. Mr. Ritter has been a civil liberties advocate for the past 50 years, including serving on the Northern Virginia chapter board of the ACLU of Virginia for almost 20 years. And his organization has filed an amicus brief in this case in support of neither party. Fourth, last, never least, Daniel Locke, the director of litigation for the ACLU's program on freedom of religion and belief. Dan litigates and coordinates a wide range of religious liberty cases nationwide and often writes and speaks publicly on religious freedom issues. Prior to his work at the ACLU, Mr. Mock was a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Jenner and Block, where he specialized in First Amendment law. So I'm going to turn it over to the speakers, then they'll speak, they'll comment on each other's remarks, and then we'll have questions. Aisha, it's yours. Thank you, Chet. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Well, my organization found this case very, very fascinating, but also very difficult. We really struggled with what position to take. We ultimately split the baby, supported neither side, but found ourselves nonetheless feeling um, a great uh, kind of affinity with Summum because our, the organization stands behind the notion that government ought not to discriminate between uh, among religions and that a good part of the First Amendment is about protecting the interests of minority faiths. And so you get a very uh, small, unknown religion like Summum that wants things on monuments like Summum is mind, thought, the universe is a mental creation. Uh, the second aphorism is as above, so below, as below, so above. And I see some of you smiling as you hear these things, and that's what the Pleasant Grove City Council did. It thought, this is kooky. It's kooky talk. We don't want this in our public park. The truth is, of course, it sounds strange only because it's unfamiliar. I mean, that Noah built an ark found one of each animal, put it on the ark, rode out 40 days and 40 nights in a storm with them, or that Jonah got swallowed by a whale and stayed there for three days and three nights and ultimately got spit out. Um, or even, frankly, that Moses received tablets of the Ten Commandments um, on a mountaintop. <laughs> it's really not a whole lot more strange. It's just so much more familiar. And in this instance, the seven aphorisms actually came um, to, in the view of Sama to Moses before the Ten Commandments with which we're familiar, and that the people weren't ready to receive the wisdom of them. So he destroyed that version, went back up to the mountain, and got a new version, and that's the one we know today. So even though my organization didn't support Sama, I was nominated and kindly accepted the task of representing their position in this case. And so that's what I'll do for you today, bearing in mind that this is not, in fact, the position my organization took. So as, as Chip mentioned, in the past, Pleasant Grove had accepted everything that got presented to them. They had never said no. They had taken a stone from a Mormon temple. They had taken a water well. They had taken the Ten Commandments from the Fraternal Order of Eagles. They took a September 11th monument donated by the Boy Scouts, a pioneer flour mill, a pretty random assortment of items donated by groups and individuals, and they said, come one, come all, we'll take it. Well, some of them cries foul. 
You couldn't allow the Fraternal Order of Eagles, the Lions Club, the Boy Scouts to leaflet in the park and then not allow us to do so. And likewise here, you can't allow them to come in, install their permanent monuments, and then say, wait a minute, now we're going to close the park because we don't like what you have to add to it. Well, Pleasant Grove turns around and says, but they're permanent. They're different than leaflets. And some of them says, well, why should a constitutional rule turn on whether something is made of granite, wood, plastic, paper? And after all, the Supreme Court has said that items like permanently installed newspaper racks are subject to First Amendment protections despite free speech protections despite being permanent. Likewise, the Supreme Court held in 1995 that the Ku Klux Klan could install an unattended gigantic cross on the grounds of the Ohio State Capitol grounds. That too was essentially, uh, uh, I, I, I suppose not permanent, permanent, but um, certainly in place without anybody standing next to it for a long stretch of time. And so then Pleasant Grove says, but, but this is government speech. We own it. It's not like the newspaper racks. It's not like the Ku Klux Klan's cross. And we've adopted it. But some of them says, but Pleasant Grove has taken no action to adopt it. They haven't passed a resolution adopting it. They haven't put a sign in front of it saying we adopt it. And they've even tried in this litigation to distance themselves from it. Um, uh, from the Ten Commandments, anyway, in this case, um, because they want to avoid being uh, uh, subject to an Establishment Clause finding that they violated the establish Establishment Clause by putting the Ten Commandments up. And uh, some of them also says, and the fact that they own these items isn't really determinative. I mean, if you look at vanity license plates, for example, those are owned by the state. But the courts have understood and recognized that there are still private free speech protections that apply to in that instance. And if it were the case that sheer ownership could defeat free speech protections, then the government can simply defeat the free speech clause by conditioning uh, the display on donation. And all of a sudden, they're out from under any protections of the free speech clause, and they can essentially engage in, in unbridled viewpoint discrimination. And then lastly, uh, Pleasant Grove says, but it's an outdoor museum. OK, uh, it's not necessarily our speech, but it's, it's our speech in the same way that a book in the library is, or a painting in the National Gallery is, or a, uh, a monument on the National Mall. We're acting as editor. And uh, some of them says, but it's not a museum. It's a public park, which is the paradigmatic kind of location for free speech activity. And it's not a situation where editorial discretion is integral to the enterprise, as with a museum or a library. and Pleasant Grove hasn't exercised any editorial discretion. They've taken everything. They haven't gone out and built a museum collection. They've accepted everybody. And lastly, that there is no coherent message to be gotten from this. It's not like a museum. It's not a museum to anything. So it's a classic free speech violation with government picking and choosing on the basis of viewpoint among speakers given access to a traditional location where free speech activity occurs. So that's, that's essentially their position in a nutshell. Um, and now to tell you why that's all wrong is Mr. Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, th thank you for the assignment. And I willingly <laughs> accept. Um, you know, as any Supreme Court case presents a number of, of interesting issues, and if they were easy, uh, you know, uh, the lower courts would have all gotten them right, and uh, the Supreme Court wouldn't have had to intervene. Uh, and if you listen to the argument on Monday, uh, certainly Chief Justice Roberts expressed his uh, confession. He confessed that he's never understood the forum doctrine uh, of the court, and, and so it re remains to be seen how, whether the court will deal with this as the Tenth Circuit did in terms of forum analysis, uh, or will they take the tack that this is government speech and uh, as a result, a result the uh, government can pick the message? Uh, on either ground, it seems to me, the, the city wins. 
First, forum analysis is applied when we have government property that is opened up for private speech, and there can be no content or viewpoint discrimination with respect to that place. And it is true that parks are classic examples of traditional public forums. There's another kind that might be applicable here, which is a designated public forum, where they open up a forum to private speech, but only on a certain subject or only by certain speakers as a designated private forum. And finally, of course, is when there's no forum at all, and that is where you have no rights of individuals to engage in private speech, and of course that probably is not so here. But on the other two grounds, first, whether or not this is a traditional public forum, I agree that it is, but it is not for the display of permanent monuments. I mean, there are many parks in the United States, and other than a few anecdotal examples like previously given, no one has ever really thought that you could place a two- or three-ton granite monument right next to the Lincoln Memorial, of course, advocating, I suppose, the fact that it was actually the War of Northern Aggression and that the South should have won, or one could place a statue next to the Statue of Liberty in favor of socialism or communism or something like that as opposed to liberty. And, you know, what is probably the closest to this is where the Supreme Court has said that while sidewalks are traditional public forums for private speech that cannot be discriminated against based on content or viewpoint, that does not give you the right to post placards on utility poles and things like that that are on that thoroughway. The second possibility is this is a designated public forum for certain content, but again, in those examples, you cannot discriminate on viewpoint. And here, at best, you have a designated public forum opened by the city for two purposes. One is for monuments regarding events of historical significance to Pleasant Grove, that's the first standard, or second, by longstanding community groups. And Summum has admitted and stipulated that their monument does not comply with either of those content-based requirements. So if it's a designated public forum, they agree it's not under the content specified for the display. Now, the other possibility is that this is just straight-out government speech. Now, of course, the government has messages. You know, Uncle Sam wants you, only you can prevent forest fires, and they are regularly conveying governmental messages regarding things that they think are in the public benefit. Now, those messages are protected from the requirement of the government giving a contrary message if somebody wanted the government to pay for it or allow it in the context of government speech because of the simple point that the government message would become, you know, garbled and worthless. And so the court, when they find government speech, has never allowed or required, excuse me, ever required that they convey, the government convey a contrary message. Now, so the question under government speech doctrine is, is this government speech? And, of course, the involvement of private parties is what the plaintiff relies upon to give, to argue that we do not have government speech. Now, that is true, you know, that has been true, that there has been private involvement in government speech in a number of cases. There are certainly examples where private parties go to the government and say, we have a message that you want to adopt, we want you to adopt, fund, and promulgate. And I've given you already at least one example of that. 
we've had examples uh, there are certainly examples where the government has enlisted private parties in the development of their message and we certainly have examples where the government has uh, had private parties convey messages such as uh, in Russ versus Sullivan where uh, family uh, people who were uh, people in uh, uh, family planning uh, agencies that are funded by the government are required to provide certain uh, information to their uh, plant to their uh, patients uh, and the court has tried to reconcile this uh, uh, in, probably the best case is the Johans case uh, which involved uh, the beef producers wanting to promote their own product and they enlisted the government in funding a program uh, where uh, both a message was developed and conveyed and also uh, the beef, certain beef, beef producers are required to contribute to uh, a fund in order to accomplish that mission. And, and the court looked at, and so there was significant involvement at every point of private parties, both in the development of the message and in ultimately the conveyance of the message. Uh, and what the court said was that first, the government selected and approved the message, which is true. Uh, the se secretary was responsible for that, even though private parties were involved in it. And that the secretary maintained control of the uh, promulgation of that message uh, going, going forward. Uh, and so even though private parties were involved throughout, it was still deemed to be a public, uh, a government message. Uh, another example would be not vanity license plates, which I consider to be a, uh, at least a designated public forum, I mean, perhaps a traditional public forum as uh, you know, opened by the government, uh, the, uh, is uh, examples where the government has adopted messages that uh, can be, that they produce license plates to convey. And of course, most of the litigation has been over the choose life, life license plates, and I represented uh, a group that got that accomplished in Tennessee, and it was upheld by the Sixth Circuit. And in that example, uh, there was a statute passed by the legislature that said there will be a license plate with this message, Choose Life. Of course, it is placed upon a uh, government uh, poster, if you will, the license plate that is required to be maintained. Now, you, you know, people have the option of whether or not to choose that or something else, but the, uh, uh, but, and that, of course, is displayed pursuant to government mandate for a period of time and then must be removed. And the court said, I think properly, that that was a government message conveyed uh, on the license plate. And as a result, the ACLU that sued uh, could, not, uh, could not get the courts to require that there also be a, uh, uh, a pro-choice license plate as well. Uh, that is different. Uh, now, that is to be distinguished, though, uh, if somebody put that plate on their car, they would also have a First Amendment right, as in the uh, uh, be, uh, be Free or Die uh, in uh, the case uh, from New Hampshire. Not, not Be Free, but Live Free, live free or Die. <laughs> live Free or Die, uh, where uh, that was a government message, uh, undoubtedly uh, conveyed, in my view, uh, on a license plate. Uh, that the that the person who uh, owned that car could have, could tape over that message if they chose to you know you have a, you have a first amendment right uh, as a private par person not to convey the government message if you choose uh, but that doesn't uh, change the fact that it is a it is a government message so now the the only uh, uh, now the Johan's case uh, re relied ultimately uh, on political accountability uh, they said look if people don't like this uh, government message, whether it is just say no to drugs or, uh, or, or whatever, uh, then there's political accountability and go to the government. Uh, and that there was sufficient information there that this was a government uh, message. Uh, Justice Kennedy didn't think so. Uh, and so one of the things to watch for if they get into the government speech area is uh, whether uh, there is viewed to be sufficient political accountability that the that this is actually a message, either of or uh, endorsed as an or uh, as in a library. Uh, 
uh, situation uh, that uh, people understand that this is a government message or not. Uh, and so that, that's certainly a question in the case. But I think ultimately the, the law is on the side of the city. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, ACS, for the opportunity uh, to present uh, on this uh, summum panel. <clears throat> Truthfully, I had not been following summum <clears throat> uh, closely uh, before the petition for cert was issued in March of this year. As a result, I helped the American Humanist Association, of which I am its staff attorney, uh, issue a press release the same day calling summum a free speech and equal access case. Now this is the civil libertarian in me. If the Fraternal Order of Eagles can erect a permanent tombstone of its religious values in a public park, then certainly Sumum and other religious groups uh, should be able to put uh, monuments of their values in the same park. But within hours, within hours of issuing this press release, I realized that such a position uh, was superficial. Uh, free speech is not the only right guaranteed by the First Amendment. Also guaranteed by the First Amendment is freedom from government-sponsored religion, which is more commonly referred to as the principle of separation of church and state. So while the two parties in this case, Pleasant Grove City and Summum, debate public forum jurisprudence, the secular and religious organizations that I represent uh, in, in the brief uh, add a step to inform the Supreme Court that it's really an Establishment Clause case in disguise. I mean no respect, uh, I mean no disrespect to Summum by this, uh, nor do I uh, uh, am trying to slight its seven aphorisms. That is not an issue to me. It is true that Pleasant Grove City in, uh, versus Summum is framed for oral arguments on the 12th uh, does not raise an Establishment Clause issue. I concede that. Uh, I asked Brian Sumum, uh, I'm, excuse me, Brian Bernard, uh, Sumum's trial and appellate attorney, uh, whether Sumum had ever written Pleasant Grove City a letter requesting the removal of the Ten Commandments tombstone in Pioneer Park that was donated by the Eagles. Now I'll explain in just a second why, why I call it a tombstone and not a monolith or a monument shortly. But Brian's response to me was very emphatic. Sumum had never asked Pleasant Grove City to remove the Eagle's tombstone. Thus, for reasons that Sumum has not complained of the Eagle's tombstone, and the city's parks are not public forums, uh, as Jim has pointed out, for donated permanent monuments, I could end my remarks here and we could go to Dan. But I have a few minutes left. <laughs> So rather than, as I said, than going immediately to Dan and wrap up the discussion, I'd like to share with you my view of why Summum case has potential of being Van Orden II, that is uh, Van Orden versus Perry uh, 2005, that held that the uh, Ten Commandments uh, tombstone in the uh, Texas State Capitol grounds uh, did not violate the Establishment Clause. I will do this uh, by describing uh, several attributes of the Ten Commandments tombstones in Pleasant Grove City in Austin. And, and it turns out that there's, uh, I think, between 100, uh, close to 160 of these uh, tombstones uh, in cities and states around the country. Uh, I will also uh, lay out the, Ameri the, uh, the Establishment Clause claim that I make in the American Humanist Association brief. And finally, I will um, I will discuss a matter of what I consider critical points, but I'll leave what that is till I get there. Let me stay, because I, I tell you, some of this, some of this material uh, is potentially very hot. Uh, let me start by saying that the religious context of the Eagle's tombstone is extraordinary, extraordinary. Indeed, it's unimaginable to the untrained observer. In recent months, that is, since I filed the uh, Summum Brief in, in June. I've had numerous phone conversations and exchanged emails with a, re with a researcher by the name of Abraham Siegel. <coughs> Mr. Siegel, who has been researching the freezes in the Supreme Court and the Eagles Ten Commandments program for several years, he's an artist by trade and a dual American-Israeli citizen currently living in Israel. He has added immensely to my understanding of the Eagles Ten Commandments program and 
that this is really a bona fide Establishment Clause case. To issue why, uh, to tell you why I prefer to call the granite monoliths at the heart of Sumum and Van Orden, uh, why I call them tombstones, I'll give you two reasons for starters. First, the monoliths are shaped like my parents' tombstones in Arlington National Cemetery, with one minor exception that the top is shaped like two tablets joined together. Um, secondly, let's see. Yeah, and secondly, and this is what I didn't really understand. There's lots of iconography on the, these tombstones. I just looked at it as pretty embellishments, you know, something that, that really was not particularly expressive. Boy, was I wrong. The, and I'll just, I'm going to give you one as an example. The, above the scroll at the bottom that usually describes why the Fraternal of Order of Eagles uh, is donating these tombstones, is two Greek letters, chi, which is uh, like an X, and rho, like a P, are superimposed on one another. Uh, I unknowingly, uh, and the courts in their decisions have universally recognized that Cairo uh, is uh, the Greek, uh, and it means uh, Christos, uh, or an abbreviation for Christos, which is Jesus Christ. I know, uh, in addition, on, either, uh, on each side, the right and left side of Cairo, uh, are two stars of David. <coughs> Now, to me, the stars of David are just a common Jewish symbol. Uh, and uh, I, so I took that as if you take uh, some of the religious activity, uh, some stuff on this, both being Christian and, and, and Jewish, and thus the Judeo-Christian uh, references that we find in these court decisions. But that's not the case. In... Uh, my understanding, uh, and, and I'm certainly not a, an expert on, by any means on, on Jewish culture, but the two stars of David on a tombstone, uh, and Abraham has explained this to me, uh, represent the terms here lies. So essentially what we have at the bottom of these tombstones is a statement, here lies Jesus Christ. That, it turns out, as I understand it, uh, it could be very well interpreted as being very anti-Semitic uh, for reasons which I uh, don't have time to further explain. But, I mean, but, uh, but also if you look at the wording, of, for example, of, of the Ten Commandments on here, it omits specifically some of the Jewish wording, particularly in the First Amendment. So, so there are other reasons, uh, and forgive me that I don't have time to explain that, uh, but my point here is, that these tombstones should not be considered as non-sectarian, uh, and if you're Jewish, perhaps they might be considered anti-Semitic. Uh, let me give you uh, a second example of the extraordinary uh, religious significance of this iconography. On each side of these tombstones are 23 four-leaf clovers. Again, I thought it was just pretty. But it turns out that the four-leaf clover uh, is also a religious symbol. Uh, in, in the fable of Adam and Eve, uh, Eve plucks a, a four-leaf clover as she's leaving the Garden of Eden, Eden to symbolize um, either the good times that she had in there that now she's leaving or for good luck in the future. Secondly, the number 23 is very significant. In the uh, Scottish Rite of Free Freemasonry, the number 23, uh, the 23rd degree, the person holding that position, is the chief of the tabernacle. Again, a very highly religious Christian symbol. So taken as a whole, taken as a whole, the origin of the Ten Commandments uh, on Mount Sinai, the, the, um, uh, the iconography, uh, the text of the Ten Commandments, etc., a reasonable observer would necessarily conclude that the purpose of the Eagles' Ten Commandments program was to promote Christianity and Catholic preferred. I submit to you uh, that there's a lot more I had to say, but my time is running out, that this case should be relitigated, as I state in my brief, 
that it should be reversed and remanded with the instruction that the parties brief and argue the Establishment Clause claim regarding whether or not these tombstones violate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks for everyone for attending today. This is a case in which my organization, the ACLU, did not file a brief on either side. I think one thing that many of us here can agree on is that it is a difficult case. I think it makes for a good law school exam question, but in terms of a case that will create law, I think it's potentially quite troubling, particularly from a civil liberties perspective. And there are a number of possible problems here, depending on how the case actually gets decided and how the opinion gets written. And so I'll just describe a few of those issues and discuss how some of the claims, the civil liberties claims, either explicitly or implicitly in the case, are at times at odds with each other. The first is something that has been discussed, and Jim laid out the basics for you on the public forum doctrine. This is hardly a perfect doctrine, but the gist of it is that when the government opens up its property for speech purposes, that it is constrained in how it can regulate that speech. There are a number of flaws with the doctrine. Among them, the level of speech protection is determined by the nature of the forum. So either it's a traditional classic public forum, like a park or a street, or it's something less. And one of the problems there is that the nature of the forum is determined by the intent of the government. So oftentimes when a government wants to permit some speech, but then it decides it doesn't like the next speaker and wants to prohibit them, they'll say, well, our intent was never to allow this sort of speech in the first place. And so by definition, it can't be a forum to allow that speech. It's quite circular. That said, it does provide, or at least in the past, it has provided some protections for private speakers. One thing in this case, there is a danger that those protections in public forums will be eroded. And I have some concern that there are efforts to slice up even a traditional public forum, because that's what we're talking about here, is a park. To slice it up and to say that certain parts of a traditional public forum are still fully protected areas of speech, but other parts are not. And I think that's an added concern these days, where we're in an age of shrinking public spaces. Of course, on the other side, we have the Internet, which is vastly expanding the opportunity to speak. But there are fewer places where there is in-person, face-to-face interaction. And depending on how the court writes its decision in this case, that may be shrinking even more. There is also a danger in what we've all been talking about, is the government speech doctrine. And again, just to reiterate, that is a doctrine that says when the government itself is conveying a message, the same rules don't apply, and it is allowed to distinguish and allowed to set that message. And when stated that way, it's a proposition with which few can disagree. Of course, when the government says, we want you in the Army, it is not required to also tell you why you shouldn't join the Army. But the problem from a free speech perspective is that if that doctrine is expanded too much, then the government will be able to get away with a lot more censorship. And Aisha mentioned one way where the government could do that. The government could say, we're opening this forum for private speakers, but we hereby adopt all of the speech that occurs in this forum. Henceforth, anyone who wants to speak on this street corner, we're going to adopt it. It will be the government speech. And so by definition, we're allowed to decide what message can be conveyed. That exact scenario is not present here, but I think there's a danger that as the government speech doctrine gets broader and broader, that we move toward a situation where censorship is more permissible. Another dangerous argument here in this case is 
that, that the city is making is that it is – this is government speech precisely because we have the discretion to decide what message is being conveyed. So as with the situation where the government is funding the arts or selecting books in a library, the, the city argues here, we get to decide what message goes out. Even if it's private speakers conveying that message initially, by virtue of our selection decision, it's our overall message. The problem there is that turns the free speech clause on its head. The whole point of the free speech clause was to limit censorship. Uh, but here the government ha is, is basically making the argument that the more we censor, the more we have the right to censor. Again, a dangerous argument. On the flip side, though, I, I think that the, the, the free speech arguments that Aisha laid out and that someone ha has made in this case are, are tough arguments to make. And uh, I think it is uh, – they're, they're going to have an uphill climb, perhaps, to, to convince a majority of the court that acceptance of one permanent monument or a series of permanent monuments automatically uh, requires that, that the government accept all other monuments. Um, and the, the way that the, that the city has phrased this is that uh, accepting a Statue of Liberty doesn't compel the government to accept a Statue of Tyranny. Um, and, I, and I think it, it may be a tough argument <laughs> to convince the court that acceptance of one monument or several monuments automatically requires acceptance of the rest. Um, I agree with what, what uh, some of the briefs have said, what Bob explained, that one of the real issues looming in the background here is the Establishment Clause. And, uh, you know, the, the problem th – there are potentially two Establishment Clause problems with, with what the city has done here. First of all, it has displayed a uh, religious monument and has conveyed a religious message merely by virtue of putting up the Ten Commandments in the first place. Uh, the second one is that by rejecting another religion's speech, it is, it is doing something else. It is, it is favoring uh, one religion and disfavoring a, a minority faith. And those are classic Establishment Clause problems. The, the, the problem in this case, however, as Bob has, has mentioned, is that the Establishment Clause claim has not been raised. So Sum has never claimed in this litigation that you're violating the separation of church and state, either by putting up the, the first Ten Commandments monument or by rejecting our monument. And so while I think those issues are looming in the background, uh, th I don't think they're going to come to the fore. Uh, there, there's also a danger, of course, that uh, if they do come to the fore, uh, that, that the court will rule on them or at least offer its opinion uh, on them in a way that will be, uh, from my perspective, unhelpful. And so I, I'm worried about that as well. As I said, I'm worried that the, free uh, that the Establishment Clause claim hasn't been raised. I'm also worried that the court will address it. And the problem is an Establishment Clause – claims of this sort are very fact-specific, and the court has made clear uh, over the years that, among other things, you have to look at, at what the intent of the government was when it puts up a display. That's why when the court, the Supreme Court issued its two decisions on, on Ten Commandments displays in 2005, they went in both directions. In one case, they said it was unconstitutional what, what the government did when it displayed a Ten Commandments monument because it had an impermissible religious purpose. And in the other case, they said, no, this, this monument's fine. It's perfectly constitutional. And these cases are highly fact-specific. The Establishment Clause facts in this case have not been developed at all because there is no church-state claim whatsoever. And so there is real danger that even if the court in a footnote talks about the Establishment Clause claim, that it will do uh, real damage uh, without the benefits of the factual record. There are a lot of other issues and, and uh, inherent tensions among uh, competing civil liberties claims, but, but maybe it'll be uh, more interesting if we get the panel involved in those and, and then get you all involved in those as well. Thank, thank you all. Um, yeah, Aisha suggested to me, <coughs> look at how nicely packed the room is now that we've, we've got to this point. Yeah, it is. And I'll bet you the people out there with some questions. And so maybe we're going to get everybody into it because anyone can respond to the questions. But I think instead of letting the panelists talk to each other without the questions, we may get back to that at the end. 
Um, let's have questions. And I guess, should I call on people? I, I will. There you go. Um, this is fascinating. I, it's, let's assume that there was a, uh, a, an establishment clause issue because I don't know how they're going to get around not, not engaging that, that point in this context. But w what would be the difference between sort of a museum context where, you know, you can have an outdoor sort of museum. I mean, it's whether or not I agree with these sort of proverbs or whatever they call these, you know, principles. Um, it's educational at least that there's this group you know, interesting, you know, we may not agree with all the proverbs, but it's, it's fascinating that there's a group that espouses these things. So from an educational perspective, isn't it sort of like a, a, an outdoor museum and what would be wrong with, from an establishment perspective, um, designating certain square footage? And then would there be another establishment clause issue with respect to which particular part of the park, you know, somebody could be in? Because, I mean, what's the difference between the Smithsonian saying, you know, we're going to have a national, we're going to have a national Native American museum and we're, we're not going to include you know, artifacts with respect to, you know, stuff that's really heinous, like, you know, decapitating people that Indians did in southern Peru. I mean, like, they, they can be selective that way from a content perspective. So, so from an establishment clause perspective, what, I guess, I'm just sort of thinking out loud, you know, what, what would be wrong with, with designating certain square footage, you know, from sort of an educational museum, letting everything come in? But Potentially, the, uh, you, you are correct, but there's, there are several problems with that. First of all, uh, in the city park, you have limited space, and you'd be able to put probably very few monuments in there without impacting the primary purposes of the park, and that's usage, general usage by, by the public. Secondly, the, the metaphor of the library or museum is really not applicable here because what we have essentially is, if you take that situation, whether it's Van Orden or uh, um, Austin, Texas, or the uh, Pleasant Grove City, there is only one religious monument, and it's a Christian Catholic preferred monument. I state that because in a library, if you go to a library and you go to the religious section, you will not get books only of Christianity. You'll get diverse faiths there. And so I would agree with you that, that, that if that could be done, it would probably be permissible as being neutral. Uh, but the problem is they can't be neutral. There is very limited space. They are picking one and only one religion to prefer. Um, I, I, number one, they are, they are not going to reach the Establishment Clause question in this case. Uh, it's not presented in any way, and court is uh, – in. <laughs> you can almost count on one hand. I'm sorry. It is not presented in any way. Uh, it, it, it's a potential claim if they want to go back and amend the complaint, uh, and, but it is not presented in the case. So I don't think there's any either danger or uh, possibility that they will consider that issue. Now, to, to discuss it, though, a little bit, um, I do think the library analogy is a useful one. Uh, uh, surely uh, no one claims that uh, in the context of a public library that uh, you have a First Amendment right to have your own particular um, uh, religious documents, uh, you know, uh, books or whatever be displayed. And it's not dependent, as was just suggested wrongly, that uh, that they do it anyway, and therefore you don't have a claim. Uh, you know, I think the uh, 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 you, you have examples, for instance, of the uh, government funding particular uh, artistic displays, some of which are uh, and and that doesn't give you a right to uh, have your own religious display uh, or your own artistic display uh, to be funded, uh, and so. Uh, Sure, and surely your, your position, even though I wasn't sure what it was, is not that the uh, Establishment Clause or some other doctrine requires in a, in a public library every single uh, religious display or none. I mean, every re religious text or but none. Re but it does, I agree, it doesn't require every single one. You can't force a library to accept your specific book, but 
it does it, uh, there would be a valid establishment clause claim if they only selected as i said one faith for presentation in the library that is the point and that is what's happened uh, in over 150 cities throughout the united states well the, 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 the Th that is antithetical to the government uh, speech doctrine. The, the government speech doctrine is that uh, the government, when the government is speaking, can choose one message. So there's, uh, uh, it, it would be quite novel uh, for uh, the federal courts to be regulating uh, what's on the bookshelves. Okay, okay, everybody wants in on this one. Aisha and then Dan. Uh, I just wanted to get back to a question about whether they could open up this kind of a museum. They haven't. Um, well, I don't think they have. Some of them, I think, to some extent, thinks they have done that kind of a thing. Um, but one of the problems with it, I think, when you are talking about permanent monuments is one that Bob pointed out about running out of space. But the other is that I think it's, it's highly likely that a majoritarian messages will dominate because those are the groups that are most well equipped to get to the park quickest with the biggest, most permanent, um, most well constructed monument. And the other thing that I worry about is governments adopting requirements that are essentially um, pretexts for discrimination. Things like an organization has to have been existent in the community for at least 10 years or other kinds of requirements that end up favoring certain categories of speakers over others. And then the other thing I wanted to mention about, uh, perhaps Dan is going to talk about this, about editorial discretion, and even when the government does function as um, uh, an editor, there are still free speech uh, uh, principles that remain in place. So the, the Supreme Court has recognized, for example, in the NEA versus Finley case and recently in the ALA case, some of the justices recognized that the government can't um, engage in viewpoint discrimination and censorship at the same time that it's functioning as an editor. Yes, thanks for the setup. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that is one of the points I was going to make. What, from the free speech perspective, the, well, I'm going to talk about the, the the two separate areas, which obviously have considerable overlap and tension. Uh, but first, free speech. From the free speech perspective, it, it, I, I think it is clear that at least in certain contexts, even the selection decisions by the government um, are constrained and, and there are prohibitions on viewpoint discrimination. There is a library case, the, the most recent library case is the ALA case, which involved um, use of the internet and, and blocking certain sites on the internet in public libraries. There was a much earlier case involving school libraries and in that case the court made very clear, it didn't, it didn't talk about the initial selection decisions so, so, and I think those might be different. Uh, in other words, what must the government accept in libraries? But it did talk about the removal decisions of school libraries and made very clear that once a school library, public school library, has a book in place, it can't remove that book specifically because uh, it, it, is, it seeks to suppress the message contained in that book. So there are constraints there. Um, but, but more broadly on the Establishment Clause point, uh, it is true that, that the, uh, as, as Jim said, the government speech doctrine allows the government to convey its message. But the Establishment Clause remains um, a constraint on the government's ability to convey its message. Yes, the government can convey many messages. It's, it can discriminate among those messages. It can put up an Abraham Lincoln monument and say Abraham Lincoln was great, and it can also uh, make sure that it, it does not erect right next to that a monument talking about how horrible Abraham Lincoln uh, was. It, it is allowed to discriminate in viewpoint in a great many ways, but, but the one way in which the government is not allowed to convey a message is to convey a religious message when it is speaking and to promote religion. And so in the library example, um, sure, the government can pick and choose using neutral criteria about what books are proper for this library and what books aren't. Um, but what it cannot do is, is pick a religion uh, section uh, and only pick books on a religion with the purpose 
of promoting that religion. And, and it's, it, it's the purpose prong of the Establishment Clause inquiry that, that comes into play here, and, that, and, and that's why, I, and I agree with, with uh, Jim that the Establishment Clause issue is just not in the case, and I doubt the court will, will address it squarely. Um, but were it in the case, it would, it would have to take a look at what the purpose was in, in both displaying the first monument and in rejecting the second. I would say, if I could, while the Establishment Clause claim is not one of the several questions that is currently before the Supreme Court, in fact, Sumum did make an Establishment Clause a state, not a U.S. or Establishment Clause claim, but it did make a state Establishment Clause claim in its original complaint. This case is here as a result of a grant of summary judgment, so it means that if this case is reversed, the, the lower courts will have to go back and actually decide the uh, potentially decide the case, and at that point, Sumum would be uh, free to amend its complaint because it's already set up an Establishment Clause claim uh, and, and, and thereby uh, have arguments uh, on whether or not this Ten Commandments uh, monument. See, we have plays. some more questions. Yeah, please, please identify yourself when you ask a question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, I'm Penny Starr with CNSNews.com. I'm wondering why uh, I think the group in Utah, for one, does not claim to be a religion, is my understanding, that they are more of a philosophy. Um, and so I wondered how, why the church and state issue is involved in it when they aren't talking about the freedom to worship or promoting a religious point of view, but it's more of a philosophy, is my understanding. And secondly, if you're talking about cultural things, for example, they brought up museums, the Nash, uh, Native American Museum, which reflects the beliefs of a people. And what's the difference with that in reflecting the beliefs of a people in Utah? Well, the, uh, I, I have a couple points on that. Uh, it is true when you get into this establishment cause argument and uh, then try to figure out what is religion and what is not religion is, is very difficult. Uh, I mean, I think there's a persuasive argument that secular humanism is religion, and just like, every, just like many other religions. And uh, when you get to that point, it's really hard to say that uh, uh, the government uh, isn't reflecting that uh, in, in a lot of things that it does. So I, I think that whole area is very difficult and very uh, uh, in order to apply uh, with any uh, consistency. Now, it could be that, uh, 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 you know, I mean, there's hostility to religion, traditionally understood religion, and uh, to the extent that, that that is manifest in these debates, that's very troubling as well. Now, uh, the, 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 the second point, though, uh, I'm sorry, I missed Forgot. Sorry. I was talking about that. There, you were talking about in a library or museum that the, the content reflects the beliefs of the yes. people, and I wondered why that isn't why it's considered an offense that when people in a community have symbols of their belief that that's objectionable and it's something that would go to the Supreme Court. Well, the uh, again, I don't. I don't think that the religious nature of this monument has anything to do with the case because we have no Establishment Clause claim. Uh, the justification that the city gives, in fact, when they accepted the monument, the mayor, er, uh, in 1971, when, when, at, at which point in time, by the way, there was no, <coughs> everyone would have believed that they could accept this monument. I mean, the, the developing case law occurred afterwards. Uh, he said that it reflects the his, uh, that is uh, that the monument is of historical significance to the community. The reason is that they were founded uh, in one of the early settlements by the Mormons. There's no question the Mormons went to uh, Utah for religious purposes uh, and motivations and, and persecution, for that matter, and uh, and that the Ten Commandments was a uh, very important symbol for uh, for that community. So. Uh, you know, that, that's what he said at the time, and I don't think it could be fairly argued that this is some sort of a pretext because he was not, you know, unless he's very clairvoyant in terms of the future in developing case law. Uh, so that was the reason, but I don't think that that uh, is any different than uh, in terms of the analysis here, the form analysis, the government speech analysis, and the, in the First Amendment free speech side. 
uh, uh, from any of the other monuments in the park. Questions? Uh, Ken Jost with CQ Press. Chip, I think I'd like you to, to take the first uh, dig at this. Uh, what would happen, uh, give me neutral analysis of what might happen if the justices deemed the case not ready for them to decide? What would happen if they dismissed it, if they digged it, as the legal jargon goes? What would happen if they would vacate with, with some instructions? Uh, do, do you have thoughts on how either of those scenarios might work? Well, you know, the case w it was decided there was a denial of a preliminary injunction. There was never a full trial. I'm not sure what issues would really get developed. Uh, given the way it's been framed as right, if it were framed as an establishment clause complaint, I suppose somebody could could be going after uh, you know what 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 Bob had to say about the Kai and the Row and the Stars of David. And that was all kind of new to me, you know. I think it's probably new to most people. So we could maybe we get back to that before we're done. But so there's no that's none of this stuff is in the record. Even even that that Sumum uh, now claims that the seven aphorisms were brought down uh, from Sinai by Moses and that. The Israelites rejected them, and then Moses had to go back and get sort of a simpler set of principles <coughs> to, 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 that the Israelites would understand. Um, none of that is that, – it's all very interesting. It's not in the record. The record is actually very sparse. So to the extent the, the Supreme Court thought we really need to learn more, the court should learn more about all – this whole story, both sides of this story, then it's imaginable. They would just vacate the judgment, right, reverse, vacate, send it back for a trial – to develop all kinds of things, including the issue of what the city's policy was about accepting displays, because there's some dispute in the briefs, too, about what the city's policy was. You know, par part of the story that gets told is Pleasant Grove turns down Sumum's monument, and then they kind of come up with some reasons why, and they say, well, you're not local, and this isn't local history, right? But the, the, the lawyers for Sumum say, well, but the Eagles were, had just shown up in Pleasant Grove when they put up the Ten Commandments, when they offered the Ten Commandments monument. They'd only been there two years in 1971 when, when they offered the Ten Commandments display. And the Ten Commandments themselves um, are not local history, right? They're tied up with uh, Judeo-Christian tradition, of which the Mormons are a part. But there's, a, there's a, pretty wide, a pretty wide gap between the Ten Commandments alone and the local history of Pleasant Grove. So there's all kinds of things that the record has not developed, and it and it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a surprise if the if the Supreme Court would say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna reverse, we're gonna get rid of the order that the city must put up the monument, and if it's gonna go back for more, it's gonna go back for more. I, I don't think that's entirely accurate. Uh, the the city adopted a policy for acceptance of monuments on its city parks before their uh, monument was was proposed. So there is a policy. And that, and, 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 and that policy was adopted a few years before uh, the presentation of this monument. And, uh, and, and it does say what it says. It says uh, historical significance for uh, the community and longstanding uh, uh, community organizations. Uh, it, and, and, sec and secondly, it is also true that uh, the plaintiffs agree that they do not meet either criteria. So, you know, now – you, it, there is question, and I agree, uh, before the adoption of the policy, uh, the, uh, there was an informal policy, and there's testimony about what that is, and there's testimony that it was like what the written policy is now, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's more definite uh, So at, at the time. And, of course, one thing about that is I'm not sure if that's pertinent. Uh, they are not asking that the Ten Commandments monument be removed. Uh, they, are, they are saying, well, we want one uh, also, uh, or we want one. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it, it, it's even possible the court could look at this as saying, well, maybe because they accepted the uh, Ten Commandments monument, maybe because they accepted the 9-11 monument, uh, uh, that they have opened up a designated public forum, but maybe now that they've closed, maybe they've closed it because they can do that too uh, with the adoption of the policy. Let me just jump in. Um, uh, to answer the question, I think a dig is pretty unlikely. Uh, I know that the opsert. Um, Why don't the, you explain what a dig is so that everybody in the room A dig knows. stands for dismissed as improvidently granted. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think the court's going to do that here because the opsert that 
um, some on file talked about the case being in a premature posture or out of a preliminary injunction with an undeveloped record, and despite that being the case, the court took it. And then the Tenth Circuit decision, which is pretty far-reaching, completely far-reaching, it's not just limited to viewpoint discrimination but content discrimination. So really everything has to be allowed in and permanently so. And I think leaving that kind of a decision on the books, um, and in fact that arises out of a trilogy. Mm -hmm. There's two other Tenth Circuit decisions that reached similar conclusions that preceded this one. Uh, I think it's going to trouble the court and they're going to want to at a minimum get rid of the decision. And doing that, vacating without guidance, um, also seems um, at this stage um, wouldn't make a great deal of sense in my mind because then the courts are left with those pre-existing Tenth Circuit decisions remaining uh, to guide the district court. And so I, I think we're, we are unlikely to get a ruling that extends to the Establishment Clause, but surely uh, we're going to get a ruling on the Free Speech Clause's role in this case. The one thing I did want to, to correct is that um, Summum's request to erect its monument was put forth in September of 03, and Pleasant Grove did not adopt their policy until August of 04. So it was about a year later, and that's pretty clear from the record. And part of their after the deny, it was after the denial. I mean, after, the, but they denied it after. They denied. They the denied it over and over. What happened is they first requested in September 03. They denied it by letter. <coughs> Some of them asked again. Then they ultimately adopt this policy and then issue a second denial letter saying it's not consistent with our policy. They claim that the policy simply enacts a pre-existing but unwritten practice. Um, and someone then turns around and says, well, that's not believable because one of the criteria you have in your policy is that a group has to have a historical uh, presence, whereas at the time that the Fraternal Order of Eagles monument was proposed and accepted, that group had been in existence for two years. So it, in fact, did not meet the criteria that, they're, uh, that they adopted. I, I have a question for the rest of the panel. It's a question and a comment. Uh, we all agree that the Establishment Clause issue about, about displaying the Ten Commandments is not presented here, nor is there an Establishment Clause issue about displaying the aphorisms, if somehow they agreed to take the aphorisms, right? That's, that's even farther removed from what's being litigated here. They haven't taken them. Why does anybody on the panel think, well, I guess maybe Bob has told us his answer, maybe this is for the others, that, that there would be even a plausible chance to win the Establishment Clause claim against Pleasant Grove when they have the Ten Commandments from the Fraternal Order of Eagles. It, it sounds so much like Van Orden versus Perry, the Texas case. There is so little evidence that's like the Kentucky case, McCreary County, County, that the Ten Commandments was being put up to promote its religious message. So would there be even, forgive the word, a prayer of a chance of the Establishment <laughs> Clause a, a claim being against Pleasant Grove City being successful? That, that's, that's the first part of the question. If the answer is no, so I think the answer is no. It could not succeed on these facts in this place. If the answer is no, why is the city being so coy and clever in the way it's arguing this case? Because the city could just say, listen, this is government speech. If we accept a permanent monument, if we put a statue in the park, we don't care where it came from. We own it. It's ours. We adopt it. <laughs> That's all that's in the park permanently is government speech. But that's not what the city says. The city says, oh, it's like a museum. Oh, it's like a library. The government speech is the collection. We don't want to own constitutional responsibility for the content of particular items, suggesting they could perhaps accept a cross if somebody wanted to put a cross in the park and it was privately donated and they were going to add that to the museum. So, I mean, are they being coy and clever because they want to be more sectarian on the next round of monuments? Those are two questions, and I'll let the, open them to anybody. But, but Dan first, because he jumped. Go ahead. Um, uh, on the second question, I think part of, part of why they're arguing the case the way they are, the city, that is, is, is the way that the Tenth Circuit law existed at the time that this all went up. And so I think they were going to have a, a much tougher time simply saying this is our speech, period, the end given what the Tenth Circuit law was already. Now, of course, now they're in the Supreme Court, and they can say, all, as they have to a certain degree, all of that Tenth Circuit law is wrong anyway. But I think that's partly what led them to 
to come up with this policy because the same question could be asked about, about the policy. They have now um, put forth and, and memorialized a policy for accepting private, privately donated monuments. They didn't have to do that at all, and that certainly strengthens Summum's free speech argument uh, to a certain degree because now you, you're, you're not saying we just pick and choose based on whatever we want. You're saying we will pick and choose based on these established criteria uh, and we will apply those criteria consistently, neutrally, et cetera. They didn't have to do any of that, um, but I think they set up that policy at the time because of the way that the, uh, that the Tenth Circuit law had evolved. And so they, they, they not, not they Tenth Circuit Establishment Clause law, but Tenth Circuit law on what was government speech and what was private exactly. speech. Exactly. Who owned it. Exactly. Yes. Um, although the, the, this, this is all against the, the, the backdrop of the way the Establishment Clause law evolved in the Tenth Circuit. Part of the reason why this case is so screwy and what arguments are raised and not raised is that the Tenth Circuit um, in the early 70s had uh, issued a ruling well before any of the Supreme Court Ten, Ten Commandments rulings that said Ten Commandments displays are, are basically secular and they're never going to violate the Establishment Clause and they're just fine. And so that is why a lot of the law um, relating to religious displays in the Tenth Circuit um, centers around free speech claims, uh, in part because the Tenth Circuit had already rejected Establishment Clause claims. They had done so before the Supreme Court ruled that, that in certain contexts it does violate the Establishment Clause to put up uh, Ten Commandments displays. And so this, this was, I think, an effort to correct the Establishment Clause problem through the back door of the free speech clause. And you want to take the other question or not, Dan, about whether there'd be a prayer <laughs> I, <laughs> I think for this I, establishment clause? I think you made a good argument for there is not a prayer. I, I think the, the um, uh, and I'll let others uh, uh, talk about this, I, I think the rejection of Summum's monument combined with the display of the original Ten Commandments uh, monument, uh, as argued in, in the brief that Aisha's organization and, and others uh, submitted, I, I think that that is a good establishment clause argument. In other words, it's not merely that you've put up religious monuments, it's that you've put up some religious monuments and rejected others, and so you have a favoritism argument, which is something more than just promotion of religion generally. I'd like to say that I think the reason why it, it doesn't have a prayer, and I'm not a religious person, but the reason why it it it, it doesn't is because we've got four or five, uh, four at least two, uh, Antonin Scalia and, and uh, uh, Thomas, that are openly what I would call hostile uh, to a founder's view of the uh, First Amendment's Establishment Clause. They are literally, uh, uh, Thomas doesn't even believe that the Establishment Clause applies to the states. Scalia believes that it's all right for uh, government to, to essentially promote Christianity, uh, but, not other, uh, uh, but certainly the other religions uh, would not be in the same category. Uh, I'm not clear yet as to what um, Chief Justice Roberts or, or uh, Alito's view is, uh, but like, I just think the real problem here is that we don't have respect on the Supreme Court bench right now for what I would call the Jefferson-Madison view of the Establishment Clause. I mean, I, I just think that is so wrong. I mean, <laughs> the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, this whole myth about a separation of church and state or a wall between church and state comes from, you know, a letter that Jefferson wrote. It doesn't come from the First Amendment. The First Amendment says, establish religion. That is a, that, that, that word, it was understood at the time to mean what the Church, the church of England, not uh, whether the government was going to be neutral or favorable toward religion generally uh, or even gen or, or some strains of religion, but that, uh, you know, it was, it was written to, to change America from England. England had a, quote, established church, which means it was a government church. And that, of course, time, there were times when you were required to uh, be a member of it or be killed by the government. So, uh, you know, uh, that, that word has now uh, big, been uh, so dramatically changed. But let me, let me mention one other thing, just in case anyone thinks that, that I just love, love government speech. Um, I do, 
you know, recognize that it has a, a special place in the analysis. But uh, uh, where uh, the, the government has legitimate reasons to promote certain public policies by taking a viewpoint uh, discriminatory, uh, in other words, have a point of view on a particular uh, item. But uh, you know, I, I am troubled by its application in a number of places or potential applications. I mean, I think one of the big problems we have in America now is an intolerance toward a diversity of viewpoint. Uh, this is most manifest in universities now where they have diversity training, you know, so everybody's got to be indoctrinated on a certain viewpoint of uh, particular uh, subjects. Uh, we have hate speech doctrines where uh, your, uh, your free speech is subject to uh, punishment. Uh, if you uh, say something that is viewed to offend some other person, it's a no, you know, it's like an offense-free zone. Uh, uh, and uh, these things are, you know, imposed by the government uh, is, in, in, in my view, uh, thought police type uh, activities. And whether in certain contexts they can be defended as government speech or what, uh, you know, is... Uh, uh, remains to be debated in their particular context. But uh, they do reflect, in my, in my view, an intolerance of a viewpoint. I think the fact that universities are uh, nearly 100 percent dominated by liberal uh, or radical professors uh, is a form of uh, discrimination on the basis of viewpoint, a lack of diversity on the basis of viewpoint, and that's very troubling. And it, it is something that uh, that needs to be dealt with, but uh, not, uh, frankly, at the, uh, at the, at the cost of, of throwing out the, the sensible proposition uh, that is applicable in many instances, that the government can promote certain public policies that they, they wish to promote. Did you want to comment on this question before uh, we I, – I see there's another question in the back, but, but I saw – I, I just wanted a, to speak to your speak. question about is there a prayer for the Establishment Clause in, in this case. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the argument that someone would make it, if it were to amend its complaint is that the monuments in this park don't present a unified message in the way that the monuments on the Texas State Capitol in Van Orden did. I agree with you. I don't think that argument has a prayer, and particularly because the court has shifted to the not to use directions, but, you know, against a robust interpretation of the Establishment Clause since Van Orden, even. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that is why we chose to advance the viewpoint discrimination claim. If we see the Establishment Clause as an entailing two different angles, which I think Dan laid out, the viewpoint discrimination claim would be as if Pleasant Grove had said, we like you, Ten Commandments, so we let you in, and we don't like you, Saman, because we don't agree with your religious faith. If, in fact, Saman can prove that, and there is maybe some reason to believe that's present here, though it's not fully developed, then maybe Saman would have an Establishment Clause-type claim um, that's distinct from the one that challenges simply the erection of the Ten Commandments. Question in the back there. I'm Victor Stone, and uh, I would like to just ask a question that uh, uh, I think derives from what I heard uh, Daniel Mock say, but I didn't hear anybody address directly, um, and it's one that at least uh, I wonder how you, how you think about it. Is there some reason why a community cannot make a, um, a sectarian uh, a determination that the only thing it wants to put in a local park is something that has some local connection. And when a group, any group, comes to it and says, we have, we're not alleging we have any members in your community, we're not alleging we have any connection to your community, but we'd like to put up a monument, does it have the right to say, uh, I don't want monuments that uh, portray uh, rugby and cricket, I don't want monuments that portray languages that are not spoken here, we don't want monuments that portray basically something that is so um, foreign to the people here that if it's going to be a permanent monument, there ought to be at least somebody in the community that wants to see it. And so when Sumum shows up and says, I'm an outsider, because they're not claiming there's a single devotee in the community, and they're not saying it's religious, so they, I mean, they, they could have, but they didn't say we have a, a First Amendment right to put it up uh, under the, the uh, 
the right not to discriminate against our religion. When they don't say that and they're just simply an outsider, what is wrong where there is no minority being discriminated against because they're not saying there's a single minority member in the community for a community to say, we'd like our monuments to have a community tie. Is, is there something wrong with that? I, I don't hear anybody arguing that. I think the court, that's what the court's going to say. I mean, uh, that, uh, that you can, and I think that would be consistent <laughs> with current law, uh, is that the government can, uh, even at the far, farther reaches of, of what they can do, they can at least uh, set up a, um, you know, have a library, they can have a museum, they can dedicate it to certain, uh, I mean, I don't know how, the example of Native American museum, I mean, how do you separate that from the religious beliefs? I mean, how could you have a Native American uh, uh, museum without uh, depictions and descriptions of their religious beliefs? I don't know how you could do that. So, uh, Yes, I, I think that you can. Uh, the, the government can. The government can do that. Yeah, I think maybe they can, but I don't yeah. think that's what the court's going to say. I, I think yeah. because I think if the court says that, somebody from some home is going to move to Pleasant Grove and say, "Here I am. I'll live here no, for a year. Well. Here's here's our monument." I think the court's going to say, "Permanent unattended displays are belong to the government. They are government speech. They don't ever create a forum because if they do, it's the stands problem of the Statue of Liberty, and I want the Statue of Tyranny next to it. It's this endless set of demands." to put up permanent unattended monuments. And it's just, it's going to be totally unacceptable. And I, I do think that's likely to be the, the centerpiece of the decision. Do we have time for one? I wasn't trying to get the last word. We have time for one more question? One more question. <laughs> I'm, I'm John, John Malloy. First, a comment. You want to double check that I, I believe the Dewey Decimal System, which most public community libraries use, have only one number out of, out of 100 for non-Christian religions. And the, um, first, from the government speech point of view, what's the significance of how clearly it's made that the speaker is a private party as opposed to speech that the government has adopted as one walks through a, through a, through, through a public park or, or, or courthouse grounds? And also, um, if virtually every visitor to the park perceives the iconography as purely decorative, four-leaf clovers, 23, and so on, what's the significance of that in, in, in any of this? Uh, very excellent questions. Uh, with respect to, to, to the latter, uh, it goes. Uh, Jim has said that that Pleasant Grove City didn't have a pretext. I think that's a bunch of bunk. Uh, it goes back to the late 1940s uh, when the Supreme Court held that the Establishment Clause applies to the states. Since that time, uh, Judge E.J. Rugemer, who uh, developed the Eagles Ten Commandments program, knew that he had to try and make this Ten Commandments monument is non-sectarian as possible, which goes sort of to the non-sectarian issue he has. But you, it's, still become, it's still religious. There are lots of people that it doesn't fit, that are excluded by this. Uh, so it goes to the issue, uh, not to the general public, but it, it could go uh, to the issue at trial, whether or not the, the state, uh, city or state had a, a, uh, a religious purpose for accepting it, because uh, most people here have agreed that that these donate uh, that these monuments on public property are the speech of government. They accept the eagle speech. They accept the religious speech on there. Uh, so, so uh, Judge uh, Rugemer and others since then, every time they go before the public, are very careful to exclude a religious purpose because that would be evidence that could be used at trial to overturn Van Orden, and, and there are so many of these Ten Commandment cases. Well, th there's a lot of examples where the government uh, conveys a message that they don't adopt. Uh, you know, uh, the Holocaust Museum, there, there's all sorts of Nazi propaganda in there. It, it, are you saying the government's adopted that, or is just a pretext that they, uh, they when they say they, they're not? Because <laughs> no, if I mean, asked, I, I, they I, would I, I, say, I no, we're not adopting that, uh, th though that viewpoint. Uh, we just think there's a historical significance to that. And if it was sitting barely on 15th Street as opposed to in a museum surrounded by labels and displays, that, that, that matters more. And, and, I, and I worry uh, uh, that a uh, little bit uh, that uh, because there's a religious message here in the Ten Commandments, that 
the, the doctrines would be distorted. I think he's advocating for a distortion of the documents, uh, of the doctrines, because it's religious. Be, because, and so uh, I worry okay. a little bit about that. A what, gentlemen? I, you know what? Our time's up. I would love to let you guys go at it for a while longer, but the crowd and the, the room, like the landlord, won't permit it. Thank you so much, all of you, for your time. Okay.